So I'm John Harthorne, the founder and CEO of Mass Challenge, as Warren mentioned. Mass Challenge is the most startup-friendly accelerator in the world. Uh, we help hi highly promising early-stage entrepreneurs to get access to the people and the resources they need to launch and succeed, and we don't take any equity or anything from them in return. Uh, we started right here in Boston in 2010, was our first competition, and I remember in 2009 at the Goodwin Proctor holiday party in this very room, I remember working the room as hard as I've ever networked anywhere. No, we didn't exist, we were just to plan an idea, and I remember interrupting conversations, just putting cards in every single person's hand and saying, my name is John Harthorn, we're going to start the largest ever startup accelerator, and we want you guys to get involved in just collecting all the business cards. So. Uh, we have a history with this very room. Uh, I, and, and now, $1.1 billion in funding raised, you know, 500 plus million dollars in revenue generated, over 6,500 jobs created. So it feels pretty good to have, uh, have made that much progress in a relatively short period of time. I want to quickly give a shout out to some of my team members that are here in the room. Uh, Scott Bailey, are you here? Where can you stand up? I'm not sure where you're sit sitting here. Can you stand up? So this is a... Uh, Scott, Scott runs our Boston program and is really responsible for a lot of the work that gets done here in Boston. So I wanted to call him out. Also, Mike and Ryan, Mike Lorette and Ryan Walsh. Can you guys raise your hand? These guys also just do a lot of the work. So, so, so I feel like we've come a long way in a relatively short period of time. But I also remember in 2010 or 11, it was 40, 2011, when Travis came to visit us at our, at our old office right over here on Fan Pier um, and to, in order to launch Uber in Boston and said, oh, we're, looking, we're seeking partners and we hear that you guys have your finger on the pulse of the startup community. We'd love to partner with you. And I'd never heard of Uber. It was barely a thing then, right? And, uh, but he, and he was super collaborative and I was like, ah, oh, he's an outsider. Why do we want to help these guys? What's in it for us? But he, he won me over. He was genuine and sincere. He just wanted partnerships and he, and he gave all of our winners uh, town car rides from our building here over to the convention center, uh, which was one of our conditions. And then in return, we asked all of our audience to pull out their phones and install the Uber app, um, uh, which I think we still probably had to spell at that point. I mean, it was still so early. And so, you know, I feel like we've come a long way, but look at how Uber has done. It's just phenomenal. What a meteoric rise. And it's done through great partnerships and just a really talented individual at the helm, plus a great team that we work with here in the Boston area and all around the world is super, super impressive. Um, so it's my honor, my privilege to introduce uh, Travis and also Alexa Fontobel, who herself is also a very, um, uh, a very accomplished uh, founder and had just recently had an exit uh, for her company. And I want to get the description correct here. Um, so is uh, LearnVest, which ensures that we spend our money smartly and has inspired thousands, if not millions, of burgeoning entrepreneurs uh, in her role as Presidential Ambassador for Global Entrepreneurship. Uh, we're also fellow Young Global Leaders in the World Economic Forum. Uh, and I should note that uh, Travis is a big fan of Alexander Hamilton, right? And you could tell from his Twitter uh, handle, let's say he has the picture of Alexander Hamilton, uh, and, and also I think really embodies a lot of the spirit in accomplishing really amazing and great feats, uh, despite uh, sometimes some, uh, you know, grumbling noises from the community, right? So uh, uh, he's really done a phenomenal job. Uh, it's been great, uh, great uh, uh, results in Boston. We're super proud to be partnered and friends. And let me welcome Alexa and Travis to the stage. Please give me a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, what you guys don't know is that what you really, um, you really just have two dropouts up here. Um, I don't know that you guys know, so Travis dropped out of undergrad, oh. I dropped out of Harvard Business School. So I feel like you guys have really lowered the bar for us today oh. um, here in Boston. Man, you uh, don't start that in, <laughs> in a university town. <laughs> All right. um, we're so excited for the conversation today. So again, I'm Alexa Von Tobel, founder and CEO of LearnVest. We're one of the fastest growing um, online financial planning companies here in America. And we just got acquired by Northwestern Mutual a few months ago. And we thought it was fitting for the two of us to come together because as a personal finance expert, um, one of the things I absolutely love about Uber is how it's just transforming America's wallets to help people get places more affordably. Um, and also, more importantly, creating a tremendous number of jobs uh, across the country. So uh, one of the things we wanted to start with today for, for Travis was, um, many of you may not know, Travis had other companies before Uber. Uh, and as a fellow entrepreneur, I myself have faced so many failures. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to hear about uh, Travis was, um, outside of just being a dropout, um, what other failures have, have, you, had to, have you had to wrestle oh, with um, in terms, uh, you know, before Uber that really helped shape you for today? Well, I want to thank you so much for the intro. Um, 
Um, no, look, uh, I've been an entrepreneur basically since I was 18 years old. Uh, my first company was a was an SAT startup. I, I, I essentially SAT prep business, but it was it was no tech, right? I started by tutoring uh, tutoring kids, and the first person I tutored went up by 400 points. And I started tutoring the neighborhood, and then the father of one of the students said, hey, let's start a business. And so we did. I was a freshman at UCLA. I was an engineer. My first class, uh, you know, I was 18. The students were 17. There were three of them, and I was dressed in a white shirt and a tie. Um, but, uh, you know, look, I, I, you know, I've had a, you know, I've had a mostly, uh, most of my companies, uh, and I, I guess I'm on my fourth now, but uh, the last couple uh, had, had had various sort of durations of, of toughness, uh, just tough times. Um, uh, the first one, uh, you know, we had a, the, the, the copyright guys uh, had some issues with, with a file sharing application that we had uh, sort of rolled out. It was pre-Napster. Uh, and we, we got sued for a quarter of a trillion dollars by 33 of the largest media companies in the world, and that was a thing. Um, <laughs> my last, my, but the company after that, we said, hey, why don't, why, don't we, why don't we turn that technology that they didn't quite like and turn it into something that they bought from us, and it was a company called Red Swoosh, and we were moving the content, but with the content owner's permission. Uh, but for the first four years, I went without a salary. We probably ran out of money two or three times. I uh, lived at my parents' house. And, you know, I like to say I got 100 no's a day for at least four years straight, right? And, uh, and so it's something that's interesting as you get into the Uber world where, you know, things are just, there's a product market fit. You're sort of going up and to the right almost from the beginning, though the beginning was a little bit slower. Um, the sort of perseverance that you get when times are tough can be invaluable when it does start to work. And, uh, and I, I try to teach that to, well, look, Uber now, just in terms of employees, we're well over 5,000 employees. And, and we talk about the champion's mindset, which is, one, put it all out on the field, everything you got. Uh, don't, don't get off that field if you've got an ounce of energy left. And two, when you get knocked down, when you see adversity, get back up. And I find that Honestly, if you just follow those two things, it's almost impossible to fail. And so even in situations where I've had a tough time, when you keep getting back up and you keep getting smarter and smarter and smarter, times when people thought, oh, Travis, man, that's a tough failure, oh my gosh. I didn't feel that way because, well, just because I, it, it just, I just didn't feel that way. I just felt like it was a success at the end of the day. Um, so. It, I think failure in many ways is a perspective, it's a mindset. And um, there are ways to, and, you know, I don't want to sound too much like Tony Robbins here, but, <laughs> but, the, but there are ways to turn adverse, it, it, it's how you deal with adversity which I think defines failure versus success. Um, would you say that there's a personality type for an entrepreneur? It's something that maybe people are really born with or do you think it's something that people learn? Um, I don't know, I think I, I, I maybe am more of an optimist on this. I think most people are born to, you know, born independent, born in a way where they're sort of, we're all set up to sort of take care of ourselves. And yes, we build relationships with other people, um, but I think often society sort of molds us into folks that maybe are, you know, maybe misassess risk. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times people believe that entrepreneurs take huge risk, but honestly, I don't, I think it's just risk can be misassessed, right? So, okay, I ran out of money and I lived at my parents' house for a year. That sounds terrible to a lot of people, but I was eating and I had a roof over my head. And so I think if you follow your dreams and you push hard, yes, it's hard and you're, you can get attached to to seeing some kind of success, but honestly, I think people, people make a bigger deal out of what they call risk than I think what is really there. Um, so as you know, people were coming up to us right before we got up here, we had everyone from Robert Kraft uh, to some of the other uh, CEOs in the room tell you how much they love Uber and how they use it all the time. 
Uh, in those early days, when did you have that sort of pinch yourself moment where you were like, wow, this technology um, that you guys sort of created and stumbled upon and, and thought could be really cool, yeah. when did you realize it was going to be this big? I think it's when Robert Kraft told me he took an Uber X. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I'm like, okay, we're in a different place now. Um, you, know, I, you know, for Uber, it's... Um, you know, if you really, if you're, you know, whatever, you know, if you're really hitting the gas, and you know, I, I like to say the Uber journey is we're like, we're on a highway, uh, we're, you know, I'm, I'm at the wheel and we're driving pretty fast, um, but, but it's also foggy, and so you really got to pay attention to the road, um, and you don't have time to look back and see where you've been, and you can only see so far ahead. And so because of the way Uber has been and just the speed at which things have gone, uh, we haven't had time to sort of step back and look. We're always sort of taking on the next thing. Um, but we really love the ride. And so there's never been that moment where you sort of pinch yourself, oh my God, look at this. It's more just enjoying solving, you know, creative problem solving and, and looking at challenges and looking at how you can, you know, how you can turn it into something interesting um, is just the everyday that I think we love. Um, so one of the things when Uber was getting started out, so in many ways you're sort of democratizing the ability for everybody to get a ride. Um, but when Uber started out in San Francisco, it was mainly, you know, probably for more affluent people. Yeah. And today with UberX, you're actually making yeah. it so that everyone can get access um, to, to a driver, to a ride. Yeah. Uh, how would you say that you're kind of shaping cities yeah. these days? Well, I, I mean, there's a good story there. I, I think it was really funny to hear about, you know, s startup kids here in Boston getting a free town car ride was actually super hilarious to think about. And I think back to our discussion uh, four years ago, we're like, yeah, this is the way to do it. And it's just like, there's a, when we started, it was a high-end thing and there was a cognitive dissonance sometimes with folks who definitely didn't have the budget to use something like this. Um, but what we realized, I, I have this principle, which is I, I call it time as a luxury. And what happens is when you have a lot of riders, then you, of course, to make the thing work, that means there need to be a lot of drivers uh, and a lot of cars, of course. And the more riders you have, the more cars you have, the more cars you have, the more coverage you have, the lower the pickup times are, the more likely when you go take a ride somewhere, you're more likely to get a ride back. And for the driver, of course, that also means uh, he or she is able to, when he takes you somewhere, he's able to get a ride back too. Um, and so what happens is this efficiency that happens when it gets big means that prices can go down, incomes can go up for the drivers, and we can make a living as well. And so what you find, though, in transportation is that it's quite price elastic. So when the price goes down, the amount of activity that happens far outstrips the price decrease that happened. And so it actually turns out that lower cost products are more luxurious because they give consumers their time back more effectively, more efficiently, more reliably. Um, and, uh, and the whole system just works better. And so when we got, we sort of got to that point in 2012 and that's when we really aggressively were rolling out UberX um, and, um, and it's been, you know, it's sort of been off to the races since then. If you think about the UberX um, rider, what, what does that family look like? What does that person look like from a demographic point of view? I mean, it, you know, it changes over time, right? So if you're going and saying, okay, all the folks who took Uber, Uber Black and now are using UberX because actually it's a more reliable, uh, uh, lower pickup time product, especially yep. in the edges of a city, um, you know, that's one kind of demographic. But like, for instance, in San Francisco now, over 13% of adults over over 18 use Uber every month. Wow. And so when you start to get to that point, you start to get to a place where, where you're trying to make this something for everybody. And so the, the city story is, well, of course when there are a lot of riders, and then of course a lot of drivers, well, you're creating tens of thousands of income opportunities for uh, individuals who are either unemployed or underemployed or just like to 
serve the city in this way. Um, of course, when you do Uber Pool, and that's you know nearly 50% of the rides that happen in San Francisco, for example, but a very growing, a large and growing percentage of rides here in Boston too, um, then you're literally taking cars off the road. So now you're talking about reduced congestion, um, you're talking about reduced pollution, and of course it makes it easier for everybody at a much lower price point um, to not drink and drive, and you know, the, there's a really interesting city story here. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of the, the story arc of, of what, what it means to get into low cost and, and the impact you can have uh, in a city. And, and of course, we're still growing quite a bit in San Francisco. Um, and well, there's still a long way to go as well. So, so we'll get to Uber Pool and U Uber Commute in a second. But when you think about Uber's growth, it's been astronomical. Um, at this point, you guys are in about 300 cities, 58 countries. Uh, and, and as an entrepreneur, fellow entrepreneur, I sort of think about the fact that you did all of that in about five years. Yeah. Um, so your foot's been on the gas. Yeah. Talk to us about um, how on earth did you scale so quickly? What were the challenges that you guys had to deal with every day? Because um, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, we, um, you know, we got, what happened is, is Boston was, I think, let's see, it was, we did San Francisco, New York, then Seattle, Chicago, Boston. So Boston, I think, was our fifth city. Um, but what happened was, is we really started to tighten up that launch playbook. How do we go into a city and roll out? And how do we find the people that run and roll out this transportation system in a city? Getting the best people in a city is critical in order to make it run well and empowering them to run it. But making it so like, well, we had a few launchers going. Yep. Uh, and you know, they would almost compete with each other how quickly they could launch a city. And then that launcher, once they hired the team that stayed, would go on to the next city. And so that got a little competitive and, and they tightened that playbook and now, you know, we can really get something rolling in, in a few weeks. Um, and so yeah, there's a girl, Austin Geit, who started actually as a marketing intern who then became a marketing manager, then a driver ops person, then our launcher, then the manager of launch, then the manager of global launch, and now runs all launch and what we call process management in the company. And she really was the architect of that international expansion. Yep. Uh, and she, she turned it into a playbook. What's, um, as part of that international expansion, what's the biggest challenge you've had to deal with outside of the United States? Oh, man. <laughs> you, know, if, you know, we, outside of the United States, I mean, we have, we're, we're everywhere, so it's like we are, you know, we're in Saudi Arabia, you know, we're in Jeddah in, and, uh, and uh, what's the other city there, Riyadh. Uh, we're in Bogota, Colombia. We're in 20 cities in China, um, across India. And so we're in a lot of really interesting places uh, where they need transportation in many cases far more than, they need, than, than even us here in the US. Um, and so the challenges can be really interesting when there is some kind of protectionism in a city, um, trying to prevent this kind of progress from happening. Uh, and you know, it's a mix of you know, trying to make friends and, and trying to work with regulators in cities, but also sometimes we're in a position where we need to fight for a city. Um, because often the incumbents will persuade the powers that be that this kind of progress shouldn't happen. Um, and so uh, we believe what we do, we, you know, one of our cultural values is celebrate the city, and we believe in that, and we believe in making cities better. And I think the, the, the situations that, that we find are often situations where we have to fight for a city um, and seeing this kind of progress happen. And it, look, there are places where we don't go or where we can't be. Like, we're not in Spain right now. Uh, right now, Germany is, you know, we don't have a lot of activity going on there. Um, you know, the same in Japan. Uh, so there's a number of places where we can't go and we really are working our butts off to try to make it work. Um, but I mean, you know, instead of going into a, like the craziest situation, I mean, I'd just go to Google and type in, you know, Uber tough time and I'm sure you'll find some. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let, let's talk a little bit about Uber pool and uh, Uber commute. So 
what gets me excited as I think about that, I think about, you know, you could potentially replace city transit um, yeah. in a delightful way, but um, how did you guys make that decision and how are you guys really dedicating resources uh, and what's the strategy behind it? Well, look, the, the strategy for us is always finding ways to help people move that are more affordable and more convenient. And so Uber Pool's interesting. What happens is you push a button, Uber comes just like it did before. You open the door and you get in the car and there's somebody else already in the car. And that's because it, we're, we're so dense in cities now in terms of activity that many times two people are taking the same trip at the yep. same time or very similar trips. Maybe you're along the route. And once you do that, you're now, instead of two cars, it's one. And instead of paying for two cars and paying for two driver's incomes and paying for two of everything, it's now one. And so you can lower the price and then the whole thing starts to spin and, and work. Um, of course, there's huge impact on congestion. I spoke about that earlier. Um, but our whole goal is, uh, or maybe our mission is transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. So a reliable way to get around your city without ever having to own a car. And you know, that's Uber Pool. Uber Commute's really interesting because it's something we launched in China but haven't brought to the US just yet. But we're excited to do so where, where you're just going to work. You're commuting to work and you're driving your own car. You can turn on the driver app and then pick somebody up on your way to work. Um, and again, this is just taking carpooling to the next level. And again, it fits that sort of cross between convenience and affordability. For the driver, only going a couple minutes out of their way and making a few bucks, you know, basically the cost of their vehicle, uh, totally makes sense. Um, for the rider, it feels like an Uber trip, yeah. but it helps to bring costs down dramatically. Um, and so those are the types of things we think about. I won't, I won't be redundant in the city story and how this really improves cities, um, but you know, we do imagine a world where there's no more traffic in Boston in five years, right? Um, and <laughs> yeah, we'll, I'll we'll all take that sooner, right? We'll take that tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I knew that was going to get a couple chuckles. <laughs> but um, but uh, no, but that's the crazy world that, that we dare to imagine. And, uh, you know, again, if we see some adversity along the way, maybe we get knocked down, maybe we don't quite get there, well, we'll get back up. Uh, so you gave the analogy, if you're in the driver's seat, then there's a little bit of fog, but you can see ahead of you. Um, you only see so far. Yeah. Uh, um, when you think about like the ultimate goal of what you want Uber to be, what does that look like for you? Well, the way we look at it, so uh, maybe the easiest way to put it is you're, you know, standing on one of the sky, you're, you're, on a, you're, on, you're on the top of one of these skyscrapers in the city and you're looking down and you see all the cars we ask ourselves, why aren't all those cars Ubered? Because if they were uh, getting around, or the, the system, the transportation system would be more efficient. And so that's how we think about it. Um, and again, you know, it sort of goes into making it ultra reliable um, and making sure that it's everywhere, all the cities and countries out there, but the every one piece is the thing that I think people don't always catch on to, which is in order to make this work for every one, is it literally has to be cheaper than owning a car in the US. And in other countries, it has to be far cheaper than even that. Um, and so our, our goal is to get this reliable and affordable at the same time. So um, on the affordable piece, and, and as I said, as a personal finance expert, one of the things I love about this is what you do for drivers. Yeah. Um, so I take Uber a lot in New York. I was in uh, my last two rides, had really interesting stories. One driver was an anthropology student who was just doing it on the side to be able to pay for grad school. Um, and another was actually a young mom who uh, was like, you know, I picked my child up from soccer, dropped him off, coming, making a few extra bucks. Yeah. Um, Talk to me a little bit about what it really means for that everyday American wallet. So if I stood on the skyscraper and I look down and you see a beautifully efficient driving yes. system and everyone sure. um, is allowing an Uber and Uber commutes letting people make more money, what does that look like um, for you? How do you think about it? Well, I, do you mean for us or do you mean for the driver community? or For both. Okay. So on the driver side, um, it's interesting. I think people don't, when you start to get as big as we are, like you, you go, you start looking at numbers and you see that 50% of the drivers on our system are doing less than 10 hours a week, right? 
And that's not necessarily what you think about when you think about Uber or how this kind of car service might work. You're talking about folks who, well, if you're doing less than 10 hours a week, this is not your primary form of income. Yep. That basically the, you're using this to sort of extend maybe your stagnant income and your current way of making a living. Uh, you know, I like to say turning a staycation into a vacation or making the holidays go a little better for the kids or just handling like the $400 bill that you didn't expect. It's, it's the basics. Um, but for the folks who for the folks who are doing more hours, uh, imagine, imagine a way of making a living where, you know, we talk about the on-demand economy on the rider side, but on the driver side, you can turn your work on. You can turn it off. And then you can turn it off. Like you gotta go pick up your daughter from school, you just turn it off. You don't have to go ask for permission when you feel ill or sick or you, don't, you just don't wanna get out of bed. You don't have to ask for permission from the man. You just wake up later and go to work when you feel like it. Um, you know, and if you have a few hours extra on the weekend, you just do it. So on the driver's side, I think that's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting story that's playing out. Um, and again, when you get to the scale that we're at, and we look at 2016, and we're looking at the millions of drivers, literally multiple millions of drivers that we're bringing on to Uber next year in the U.S., um, it's a situation where you can really deal with the underemployment problem, the unemployment problem, and wage stagnation um, for the average person that maybe wants to just get a, a leg up. So, so at LearnVest, um, our users link their financial accounts. We see their entire wallet, and we connect them to a financial planner. And one of the things that's been really interesting um, from the data that we see now of hundreds of thousands of families across the country is about 40% of them are now what we call freelancers. Um, they're 1099 employees where they are not working a typical salary. They're actually making money in these micro ways where they're sort of connecting the dots. Um, and to your point, what we're finding uh, from those households is it allows them to get ahead to make extra yeah. money. Uh, and, and as I said, that soccer mom I was riding with, uh, what was so great about the story was it allowed her to be able to be with her family when she needed to be, to work when she needed to be. Um, you couldn't have possibly thought when you're creating the technology behind Uber yeah. that you're going to actually be one of the leading reasons yeah. why people are changing how they work. You, you can see millennials throughout the yeah. future, we're not going to work nine to five anymore. Yeah. We're going to work a little bit at midnight, sure. a little bit in the morning, do what we want in the middle of the day. Um, that's crazy, Travis. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Uh, look, I mean, it's great. <laughs> Uh, I do wonder, though, like, did the person, did the, did the mom actually identify herself as a soccer mom? Yeah. Or, <laughs> she actually I always did. wonder about that. <laughs> she just gone, she'd literally just gone to soccer practice. Oh. And what, what's been so great is, again, you're seeing all walks of ages yeah. um, driving and, and actually really being able to provide for their family. So as you think about Uber today, it's now 5,000 employees and scaling, yeah. right? You guys are in many ways just really getting started. Um, how do you think about as you're growing internally that you called it the champion culture? Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about how you're keeping that edge, especially amongst all of the different adversity you guys have to face. Um, well, look, I think it starts with just having a big goal and then, it, then having great people, empowering those people to do great things making them accountable so that when they don't, well, you know, the, the cream rises to the top. Um, but uh, part of it's also about uh, stepping on toes, Yep. right? So uh, the this, this story, this, this story I like to tell on this is I was talking to an engineer and she, uh, she had a great idea. Uh, I'm like, um, hello, why have we not done this yet? You gotta be kidding, like why, are we, why aren't you working on this right now? And she said, well, I didn't wanna step I didn't want to step on Santa's this other toes. person's toes. And I said, so your desire to be comfortable and not, not sort of upset somebody made Uber worse today. And so part of what we do is we try to let folks know at the bottom, from the bottom up that they should be stepping on people's toes not in a mean way, but in a way to like make sure that great ideas are heard. And from the top down, we have to be very welcoming of having our toes stepped on and basically learn to be really good listeners. And that's actually how good ideas can rise to the top. And without doing those things, 
you can be doing really great, but you don't have a culture that's going to come up with the next great thing. And so I think the fun part about that is teaching the young people that come into Uber, that we're hiring, that you know, are bright-eyed and idealistic, uh, you know, well, I guess kind of like me. <laughs> but, um, but the fun part is teaching them that they, that they should fight for, you know, I, I like to say know what's right, fight for it, and don't be a jerk. And, and giving people, the, like empowering people to think that way, I think is powerful. So we'll open it up to questions in a second, so start thinking about if you have any questions, but two more questions for you. Um, so one, how are you guys maintaining that real edge to make sure you have the best talent? Because I think everyone in this room knows talent really is everything, especially to a company that's growing as quickly as Uber is. So um, how do you think about making sure you guys really stay there? Yeah, well, you know, I think the, the way we interview is we like to simulate what it's like working together. And so in that way, it, as long as you know what you're looking for, you then can make sure you get it because you basically, during the interview process, you have the first day on the job, right? Yep. So I'm already like, wow, you did great your first day on the job interviewing. And so that helps. But the key is to hold that bar. I mean, this is the standard stuff, but hold the bar high. Um, don't settle for less. And, and at the beginning, you got to hustle to try to get those right people and really, it's hard because you need to fill a position. But if you hold that bar high at the beginning, you can create a culture of excellence. That then, you know, our first general managers that we hired were imp like impossible to get. They were so difficult. But once you had a sort of a group of really great general managers owning cities, you know, running cities, then it, the next group and the next 100 and the next 200 GMs became much, much easier. And we could go to the world's best business schools and recruit from there. Um, and so it's any project you're doing, just start with excellence. Hold it even when it hurts. And um, I find that ultimately that pays off. So as we think about 2016 and the extremely bright future of Uber, um, what are a few things that you think that uh, we should sort of look out for as uh, we go into 2016? Well, look, I think for us, the Uber pool thing is going to be, the Uber pool and Uber commute thing is, is going to be big because yep. we, are, we are literally, right now, it's over 10% of all trips that are happening in Uber globally. Wow. And that could literally go into the many tens of percents. And, and then, again, it's like what we can do in terms of price, what we can do in terms of growth, what we can do in terms of traffic uh, becomes pretty substantial. Um, especially when you cross with a deep penetration in a number of cities around the world. So I think that's the big story for us that we're really excited about what's coming. Yep. And when you then talk about the, the millions of drivers that will be coming on the platform, in the U.S. alone, but you know, then of course around the world, I think that's also going to be, that's also going to be really kind of, uh, we're really looking forward to it. Got it. Yeah. Um, we'll open it up to questions. There's a few people walking around with mics. Uh, whoever has the mics, we'll let you go to the first question. Yes. Sorry. Hi, Travis. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm on crutches, otherwise I'd stand. Um, my name is Chris Hansamo. I'm a second year MBA student at Boston College. And my question to you today is about um, your most surprising piece of data that you've uncovered over the years that maybe you weren't expecting, but that's actually been tremendously helpful, perhaps, in messaging and marketing, especially when you receive pushback. Um, I was reading this morning that in uh, Augusta, Georgia, um, Uber was rolled out shortly after or during the masters. And since then, the number of DUIs has completely plummeted. I'm just curious if there are any anecdotes or pieces of data similar to that that um, really interest you or that you can kind of hang your hat on? I, mean, I, I think, you know, in terms of data that's been super interesting, um, there's, oh, man, there's so many anecdotes. Uh, drunk driving is definitely one of the interesting ones and getting at the data where you can see drunk driving incidents literally going down is a big deal. Um, but there's other things where, you know, where when we, you know, as we've found efficiencies to lower prices, we've also been able to figure out ways for drivers to get much, be more, much, much more productive because those, as those prices come down, people use it much more often. The elasticity sort of allows for great productivity. And so 
allowing sort of earning potential to go up as prices come down has also been a pretty remarkable thing that we've seen in a number of cities. In New York, for instance, uh, we put out a blog post that showed what drivers were making year over year. We basically took four Septembers from, I think, 2012 to 2015. And every year, the income of the drivers is going up while our prices are coming down. And that's one of the more surprising and interesting things that's allowed us to to have a greater impact in cities and have a greater impact for, for people who maybe are in uh, parts of the city that don't have access to public transportation or maybe they can't afford, uh, they can't afford a car, you know, things like this. And just having greater impact because of that, that one phenomenon right there. Hi, there I am. Um, I, I appreciate what you were saying earlier about overcoming challenges and how important that is to do so. And among the challenges I imagine that you consider is how to ensure safety for passengers. And clearly that's been a big issue around this country. Sure. In terms of background checks, fingerprinting, Uber seems a little bit um, in flux in terms of where you are on those kinds of questions. Could you address those? Yeah, of course. So, you know, if you're going to build a transport, you know, if you're going to sort of build a transportation platform in a city, safety, safety has to be a critical part of that. Uh, you know, the, the, at the highest level, we like to say that the, our, our aspiration is for Uber to be the safest place in the city. So can we get to a place, there's like a mic on the ground that's making noise. Um, can we get Uber so safe that it's safer than anywhere else in the city. And that's the aspiration. Now you go and then get into the details. There's the experience that, of course, starts with background checks that we, we feel like our background checks at this point are they're not in flux. I, I, I know there's a lot of chatter and, and there's media around it, but we feel very good about where our background checks are um, and feel that they're more robust than most anything that's going on out there. Um, you know, fingerprints are a particularly interesting part of that discussion. Um, there's a database, uh, a system called LiveScan, uh, which, uh, which can, it's like an FBI database that goes in, you, you do a fingerprint and it can then check and see, uh, well, have you been arrested for a particular crime? The issue, of course, with a system like that, well, of course, there's errors with fingerprints all over the place, but the other side of that is, in many states, the vast majority of the, of the files they have only have the arrest record, they don't have conviction. So if you've been arrested, you then can't work. And we find that to be particularly discriminatory. And so the question is, can you find ways to, can you find ways to make sure that folks coming in are safe, as bet to the best of your ability, without discriminating against people given all the things we see in the country today with how they get arrested and whatnot. And so there's a balance there. No system is gonna be perfect, but can you create tech, you know, can you create sort of a filter up front, but then remember, we're tracking that ride via GPS, right? We know everywhere that driver went, we know everywhere the rider went. Um, we uh, have star ratings afterwards where if there's an issue with that driver, maybe the driver's irritable, or maybe the rider yelled a racial epithet, for instance, which can happen. Um, what are the things that can lead to safety, or sorry, lead to unsafe situations, and can you get in front of them, um, given the information that we have? And so we're using a technology platform to do far more than, well, what happens when you get in a taxi? You know, there's just, the technology is not there to, not just, you know, the technology is not there to make it, to make it as safe as possible and certainly not there to make it safer every day. And so that's how we think about it. We'll take two more questions. Ah, right here. Hi, I'm Stas from the Cambridge Innovation Center. Um, I've got a question on, uh, as you guys go global, um, so I was recently in Beijing and I uh, pulled out Uber and I was able to, 
uh, look at the app, but it was a Mandarin. So I was, uh, and I was in India earlier in the year and it was in English. And I was wondering as you're globalizing the marketplace, if you're seeing people use Uber who are coming into different cities who are traveling or if you're seeing more local use than traveling use. Um, and, and just one quick uh, question. Uh, there's a gentleman who asked a data question. Now, I know that you guys have a partnership with the city of Boston around data, and, I, and, that, and partnerships like that exist with different cities. Are there any interesting anecdotes that you've learned from that? So the first part is a vast majority of the rides that happen on Uber are, and in any city are happening, are hap are, are the, the riders are pe folks who live and work in the city in which they're taking the ride. That's like well over 90%, in some cases over 95%. There are what you would call cross-city network effects for people who travel, but it's a small percentage of what's going on. That's part one. Part two in terms of data and partnering with cities. Again, if, if we're all about celebrating cities and making cities better, then we should be able to find ways to partner with cities to make those cities better given the data that we have. Now, it's important when you do that to protect the consumer and protect the driver and protect generally privacy. Um, but generally, cities don't want to know where an individual went. They want to know, well, what are the general patterns that are going on? How can we, how can we lay out infrastructure that makes the city more efficient and, and, and makes the quality of life in their city better? And we're all about that. And I think the burden is on us is to find ways to not just like, oh, here are the trips. Because I, I think there's, there's real privacy issues with something like that in, in handing over to a city. Uh, but, but rather, like, what's the analysis that can lead to real actions by cities and by states in order to make their cities better? Um, and, and that's sort of, that's the front line of what we're doing with cities today in terms of data partnerships. We'll take one last question right here in the middle. Hi, Travis. Uh, first of all, thanks. It's a commendable goal that you've got for Uber to solve Boston's traffic problems in the next five years. Let's do mm -hmm. it. We've been trying to do that for the past 300, so we'll see what you can do. Maybe we start in Foxborough after a Patriots game and Fair solve that problem. Um, I want to talk about Uber's future. You know, earlier this year, you guys bought or hired uh, 40 of the researchers from Carnegie Mellon's Robotics yes. Institute. And you're talking about the advent of millions of people coming on to drive for Uber. Yeah. Then we talk about driverless cars in the future. Sure. How are you going to balance that? What's the future of driverless cars and Uber as a Logistics yeah, platform. no, it's a, it's a fair question. I think, you know, you say, how are you going to balance it? I mean, that's, that's an interesting and tough balance. Uh, you know, driverless cars, that kind of technology has been worked on for, well, in, in a lot of cases, decades. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, there are 30,000 people that die every year because they were in a car accident. And there's hundreds of thousands of people who are injured. And there's billions of hours spent, maybe even tens of billions of hours spent uh, sitting there driving, getting stressed and being anxious, and just all the bad things that come with that. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why companies like Google have been working on that since literally 2007, trying to get their driverless cars going. Um, and the future comes, right? I mean, the, you know, now you've got Tesla and you've got Apple and you've got the manufacturers all working on driverless cars. And so the question for Uber then is, do we want to be part of the future or do we want to resist it? And if you look at our DNA in some ways, well, look at the incumbents that, we're, that we've gone up against in the past, namely the taxi industry, trying to hold progress back because their model is a certain way. So as a tech company, we say we want to be part of the future. But with the particular challenge of what happens when you go into autonomy, we look at it as a sort of a, it is a challenge, but a, an opportunity for what I call optimistic leadership, which is how can we partner with cities for when that transition happens? Look, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen right away. You know, it's, it's gonna take a lot of time. It's gonna take, you know, many years, if not decades to get there. And that transition will take time. And so um, what are the things you can do, whether it be vocational training, uh, education systems and education programs, um, for how folks can transition when that, when that time occurs? But the thing is, is that it is far away. And, and so, well, what that means is let's start planning for that now. Let's start working with cities to figure out how that transition can happen in the most optimistic way possible. 
but autonomy is something that is coming. Again, you're gonna, it's gonna start with, oh, you know, I, 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 I've checked out like a Mercedes that you, know, you can drive and it will just, it will not let you run into the car in front of you. It just won't, it will break if you're going too fast. That means no more cars get rear-ended, right? That's a positive development. You've got ones where they sort of have cruise control. I think the Tesla has cruise control now. And uh, it tries to identify where the lane is. And it just makes, it's trying to make driving an easier, less anxious activity. But over the years, these things are going to stack up. And then it will eventually get to full autonomy. Uh, that world is coming. And so then the question is, what do we do about it given that? And that's, that's how we look at this particular challenge. So as I think about it, I think what we heard here today, um, Uber will make sure that uh, around the world, fewer people need to own cars, which means lots of people can save money. We're creating an economy for people to be able to make more money for their families. Sure. We're creating an infrastructure and system that could potentially replace um, commuting uh, in so many ways in big cities and save money for cities. Uh, we're also creating a foundation that allows us to move goods and services around uh, this infrastructure faster and combined with potentially driverless cars, uh, I think you can almost get a sense of what's ahead of the fog for Travis uh, in the coming decade. So thank you guys so much for having us here today. Travis is such a visionary leader. I think I could sit here and ask him questions for another hour, um, as many uh, of you probably would agree. But thank you guys so much for having us and thank you so much, Travis. Thank you.